Thank you for coming. Welcome to Art in Context. I'm Laura Freed. I'm the Associate Curator at here at CAM. Um, with me is Trisha Paik, the Assistant Curator of Modern Contemporary Art at the St. Louis Art Museum. Um, you probably know. And this is Art in Context, a preview of what's to come. Um, did did any of you come to our last Art in Context talk in August? We've started this new program as a, um, as a way for our members to um, get a little bit of a preview of the shows that are going to open the following week, next Friday, for these shows, um, and to provide some context, a little historical background, um, and a way for us to connect with our colleagues, too, before the show. This is a particularly... Um, a special occasion because um, uh, for Richard Aldrich's show, we are borrowing four um, 19th and even early 20th century paintings from the collection of the St. Louis Art Museum, and Trisha was instrumental in making that happen. Um, so tonight, we'll uh, I'll talk briefly about the um, the show Manon du Bourg, but um, we're really going to focus tonight on talking about. Richard Aldrich and um, sketching a, a kind of um, broad history of um, 20th century painting. Um, so, should we yeah, begin? begin? Yep. Um, feel free to ask questions while we're chatting. Um, this is, you know, it's meant as a conversation, and we'll, we'll leave room for questions too at the end. Um, okay. So, our. Um, let me talk briefly about what uh, the, um, the second show that's opening on Friday. Um, the space that we're sitting in now, our performance space, which as you, um, which is, you probably know, is um, really a, a social space in the museum um, meant for um, not only our, um, our parties and um, uh, not only our parties and our events, but things like public programs like this one. Um, and we have a stage, as you see behind us. Um, and uh, for this, for Manon de Boer's show, Manon is a Dutch Brussels-based filmmaker. She's chosen this space um, as the central exhibition space for two of the four films that we're presenting in this exhibition. Um, Manon is an experimental filmmaker. She's in the middle of her career. Um, she, uh, she's been in Brussels now for about 20 years and is deeply invested and engaged with the artistic community there in Brussels. Um, she works very closely with three other filmmakers, um, often who exhibit work together. This is how I was introduced to Manon, actually, because I showed uh, the film, uh, one of the films of one of her collaborators in the front room just a couple of years ago. Um, and Manon, uh, in her works, which are largely non-narrative, um, experiment, experimental films, as I said, um, most of the films are um, framed as portraits. Portraits of musicians, writers, um, other artists in and around Brussels. Uh, all of these portraits that she makes are each shaped by um, and I'm, these are stills from the films that we're showing, um, largely shaped by questions of memory, um, time. But in each of her films, and what's so distinctive about Manon's practice as a filmmaker is that she's, um, she has this acute sensibility when it comes to um, manipulating, thinking about, editing, um, and working with sound in her films. Um, we are, for her first major exhibition in the United States. Um, we are featuring four key works that address music and sound um, and how music and sound for Manon and within her film structure your experience of the film itself. Um, so what you'll see in this room are two films, um, two films projected on screens and then we'll have a theater space that we're creating in Gallery C just, um, just next door. And um, I should, yeah, let me move more quickly so we can get on to Rich. Okay, so um, these will be, uh, and we didn't want to show the films, of course, because you really um, have to see them once projected. Um, these are films about dancers, um, composers, and um, performance. Uh, 
we'll have a, you'll have a chance to hear from Manon next Saturday during our artist talk at 1 p.m., the day after the opening, um, which I hope you can come to. But we should, let's move on to, sure. to Rich. Um, Richard Aldrich is a um, young Brooklyn-based painter from Ohio. Um, he went to art school in New York and has been working there since. Um, and uh, this show, which comprises about 20 of his large-scale works, um, is, uh, is a show about painting, um, but it's also a show about um, uh, new ways to think about painting. Um, Rich is um, an artist who's, he really is at the forefront of a new generation of, of young painters. He's doing something that um, uh, you, we haven't seen um, from previous generations in a way, and he's, um, a real focus for him is a resistance of a, um, a resistance to being pinned down. What you'll see from work to work is a real diversity in technique, um, from uh, abstraction to object-based or sculptural paintings, um, which you might, I mean, this, this painting bed, um, you might think of Rauschenberg's combine paintings, his bed painting, um, Richard makes, uh, produces canvases, some of which have no painting or brushwork on all, at all on them. This is a, um, a canvas on which he's, um, he's uh, inserted his own drawings. Um, and then some of the works um, are even, you know, have, uh, have removed the hand entirely where he's appropriated a text. For example, this um, Nina Simone, uh, these Nina Simone lyrics. Um, and for Rich, it's, um, on, on the one hand, he is, he's keen to present a varied technique um, to, to prompt his viewer to focus on what is in front of him or her. Um, but more than a, a concept, a kind of cold conceptual project about how techniques can vary from painting to painting, in each of these paintings you'll find a, um, an exploration on Rich's part, on R Richard's part, uh, to find a way to communicate everyday experience. These paintings are all deeply personal. They take elements from, and sometimes actual objects from the studio. Um, and beyond, such as a page of um, a page of poetry or lyrics, as you see here, um, scraps of canvas, cloth, fr shards of frame. Um, they reference his investment in music. He plays for a, he plays with some other New York artists in a band called Hooray, um, and the personal relationships that make up his world. Um, the paintings themselves are inter deeply interconnected, and you can find quotations, translations from one painting to the next. Um, and in this show, um, which is really the, this is his first solo museum exhibition and his most comprehensive installation to date, um, this show will be presented, and you'll see this next week, in a way that's really geared towards pushing you, pushing us to find the connections from one painting to the next, um, because while you know, on um, you, I mean, you'll see this resistance to a categorical style. Um, there really is a shared sensibility among all of the works, and you'll even see passages repeat themselves from one painting to the next. Um, so this is a painter who's really thinking about what it means to make a painting today, to work and abstraction um, that's very much about personal experience and um, how to communicate with, um, how to communicate it on a canvas that goes beyond simply the application of pigment to surface. And more importantly, to how to, how to communicate it to you, the audience. Right. And for me as a curator of contemporary art at the St. Louis Art Museum, you can't hear, um, um, my mission I really believe is is putting, of course, contemporary art in context. And so when Laura invited me to join her in this conversation, mm -hmm. this art in context, it made perfect sense because Richard Aldrich is an artist who is indeed 
looking back not just to um, post-war examples from the past 50 60, 50, 60 years, but he's actually going back further to the late 19th century and the early 20th century, and that's the mm -hmm. reason why Laura had asked uh, to borrow some works from our collection, which you will see um, when the show opens uh, next Friday. So what we thought we would do is kind of a, a little quick history going back in time, first looking at some post-war examples that are in our collection, and then going further even back in time to looking at some 19th century examples. Are you joining us in front? Or are you Oh, great. Good. Please we can move speak up, up closer. A bit. Yeah, we yeah. can speak up. <laughs> the mics are working now? Okay, good. No, they're not? They're not. I think sometimes they require us to be closer. All right, I'll be, I'll be closer. Is that better? Okay. Well, what I wanted to remark about in Rich's work, um, some that you've seen here and that you'll see next week after the show opens, is this notion of what we art historians like to call the unfinished. You know, you think about a work that's unfinished, mm -hmm. but the notion of the unfinished as a noun, that he is an artist who is not completing his work. He is not giving you the total picture. And if you go back in time, and we'll show you the examples that we have from the 19th century, is that, um, you know, art until the, into the early eight, early 19th century, the artist really intended to give a complete view of something, as if the canvas is literally a window onto the world. Mm -hmm. And as you'll see, um, and I'm not sure um, the level of understanding of 19th and 20th and contemporary art, and that's the reason why we have this program for you to learn, is that this window of the canvas starts to fall away um, with the Impressionists and into mm -hmm. um, the post-Impressionists with uh, Cezanne and Van Gogh and Gauguin. And then the 20th century is completely blown apart. Right. And so what Rich is doing is referring to that kind of level of not giving you the complete picture mm -hmm. and that he's an artist who I'm learning from Laura is also very much engaged with the langu language and with words. So that his areas of, uh, of unfinished or areas that are not complete are in some ways pauses in many right. ways of this kind of visual language and they're kind of these silences between, between the, the visual words, yeah. so to speak. Yeah, that's <clears throat> Yeah. So um, here is a work by Philip Guston, which is in our collection. Are people familiar with this work from visiting the museum? Um, this is from a cheat sheet here from 1957. And I just learned last night in pre preparing for tonight that he was actually an artist in residence at Wash U. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry I didn't know that, but now I know. And um, here we brought this together. Do you want to show the next one yeah, too? Yeah, sure. The, yeah, that one. Towards this. And this is a painting um, by Rich done last year. Um, and you know, you can see, um, uh, you can see even from in a, uh, the Gustin is from the 50s? 57. Yeah. 57. Um, you can see um, even in this um, vast gap of time, um, here is a young artist who's still thinking about what it means to make an abstract painting. Um, of course, the impulses are different, um, and he certainly um, knows that with a painting like this, he's referencing a, a rich and um, loaded history of abstraction. Um, you know, um, with a work like this too. Uh, this is from 2009 as well. Um, this is um, a three layers text shape texture. Um, and I wanted to show this actually just before, um, before another painting from the St. Louis Art Museum, but I wanted to point out, and you won't see this until you're, so you see it in person next week, but there is actually an under layer of text um, poetry um, actually that that provides the kind of ground uh, for the painting so even when hit masked he's he's thinking about how to incorporate other elements 
Right, and here we have our Franz Klein from 1959 to 60, which is currently up on view. Um, and here I think is a great um, example to talk about um, the history of 19th and 20th century painting mm -hmm. in many ways as a history of the brush stroke. And it's a very kind of, um, um, you know, linear way of looking at how modernism develops, but it's a very useful tool that I found in, in talking about how art emerges from, as I was saying before, this kind of window onto the world, totalizing complete experience that offers a finished painting to moving into the 20th century where we go into abstraction and um, how artists are manipulating the brush stroke. And so here you have, um, these large brush strokes painted by Franz Klein's uh, house uh, house paintbrush, and these broad strokes. And um, there's a story that he was looking at his black and white drawings underneath a magnifier or something, and that's how he kind of came upon to these enlarged brush strokes. Mm -hmm. And that um, the brush stroke in earlier painting, which we'll show you in a few minutes is something that describes reality, what we see in the world. And as you move into the Impressionists, and into Matisse, and Picasso, and, into, and then of course the Jackson Pollock, the full culmination of that, the brushstroke loses all ability to describe what you see, mm -hmm. and now it's all about materiality. Right. And here you have this perfect example of this material brushstroke that is still architectural. It's describing this kind of construction of something, but you're not really sure what indeed it is. And that, I think, is also what's remarkable about Rich, Richard's, Richard's yeah. work is this ambiguity and these uncertainties and these silences in his work. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, right, you're getting your... Um, you aren't getting a, um, a, a window onto a total world. You're getting a fragment of an experience. Um, and it's a very personal experience. And it's very personal, personal right. Experience. And so in a work like this, what you're not seeing is simply, um, you know, and even with the Klein, there were, um, you know, there are associations um, and implications of him using a house painter's um, roller or large brushes, um, you know, um, pedestrian tools that aren't typically associated with um, with a work of fine art. Uh, now, Which was new back then in the right. 50s, but right. it's not new now. So what right. is what is a contemporary artist supposed to do today? Right, exactly. That the challenges have have all been met in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, right, absolutely. And so he, you know, aware of this history, aware of um, even how the viewer responds in uh, the 21st century to post-war painting from the 40s, 50s, even 60s, um, he presents that to you. I mean, he offers it up, um, even in a work, you know, especially in a work like this, um, for you to think about what that means looking at a painting that was just made in the last two years to this. But he is um, slyly inserting more personal, intimate aspects into the work to, to push it away from that. Um, but should we move? Yeah, yeah, well, we can just yeah. quickly, here is, um, sorry, it's not the best oh, image yeah. of our, um, our Stella okay. in our collection <laughs> that's currently on view, as well as um, our Ellsworth Kelly Spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, the Stella's from, oops, oops. Oh, just one back. The Stella, the Stella is from the 5059, and yeah. the, the Kelly Spectrum is from the mid-60s. And I just wanted to introduce that. Of course, it's very different from what Rich is doing, although there's certain abstractions that mm -hmm. have this kind of pristine look. But to kind of show you what's happening in the 60s of this elimination of the brush stroke, and then its complete return later in, in the 80s. So I just wanted to foreground that so you have that, because I think in looking at how an artist applies paint to a canvas, you can learn a lot. And again, I'm reducing this to a very specific history of the brushstroke, but I think it's very useful to help you in looking at, at paintings when it's made at any point in time. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, should we... Um, yeah, do people have any questions or, or comments or observations or frustrations? <laughs> Want the viewer to get. 
That's did, a really everyone, did everyone hear that question? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I mean, particularly with work like this that is not um, with work like riches. And, and in a minute, we're going to continue on to talk about this um, this older history that he's engaging. But um, let me pull back to um, to a work like this. Um, you know, it's these are um, these are not entirely legible works. It is, you know, he he's not making this personal experience explicit for you. Um, you know, you're getting a hint at um, something in the titling, um, and this show, in a way, this sh um, one. You know, one goal of this show for the artist and um, for me as a curator, for us, is to show the breadth of his investigations and to, um, and since we're showing so many together for the first time, um, opening a window in a way on to, into the way that they uh, connect with each other, which reveals more of his story than ever before. Um, but it's, what he's prompting you to do, and I, I've talked, I've spoken to Rich about this. He, he's, um, he's looking for his viewer to search for himself. Um, what he, what, what, what he can deduce from the clues that Rich is giving you. Um, I think he gives clues and titles. In right? titles, titles um, with names of people who have inspired him. Right. Um, this and visual clues, cues right. too. Right. This painting, for example, is called, and I. I have to refer to my notes because it's uh, narrative with Sid Barrett, Robert Smithson, John Cale, Patty Waters, Dan Van Golden, Richard Aldrich, and Can. Um, it's a it's a work that obviously references art history, music, self portraiture. Um, these are drawings that he. This is a painting from 2008, but drawings that he was making over a period of time, and then decided to turn it into a painting. Um, but I think what um, what you're getting, you know, from one painting to the next, for example, the Nina Simone, um, and especially when you see this and you see this work in person, and you really see that the hand is absent, that he's reproduced this text um, because he's chosen the the subject itself to speak for itself. Um, it it pieces together, but only by fragments, um, a story that he's creating for you, but. Um, but does he find? But does does Richard find that some of his works are more personal than others? Um, I, yeah, I think he he sees them as all personal in some way. Yes, definitely. I mean, there are some that um, there are some that I think are more rooted to philosophies or ideals of painting um, that address sort of larger. Um, theoretical issues about painting, but then there are some that are very much about his per personal relationships, um, uh, his his own music, his own writing, and those are largely hidden to the viewer. Um, I th you'll be able to see, and it's only in what he chooses to reveal to you through titling, through the right. text that he writes. Um, and it's important to say that, of course, even though you can say that all kind of artistic production is personal, yeah. the notion of the personal is really a modern, you know, a modern approach. I mean, if we right. now go ahead, I'll let you do it. Oh, yeah. I'll just um, um, go back to the Corbet. Yeah. This one. There we go. Yeah, so here we have a Courbet in our collection from the mid 19th century, um, 1858. And you know, Courbet did paint his family and his friends, and so there was a personal notion. But you wouldn't say that this landscape was a, is a personal painting. And here is a good example of what I was talking about, the kind of window onto the world, mm -hmm. the artist standing in front of the world, painting what he sees, and um, you can kind of match up the canvas to that one portion right. in this town of Ornon in, in France. And that this experience starts to disintegrate, for example, with our, with our Monet from 1903 um, in our collection, where the, the brush stroke starts to, as I said, not describe exactly what mm -hmm. you see, um, and the introduction of colors that are not necessarily 
the Impressionists, of course, believed that they saw those colors, but you did not mm -hmm. see them as blue and pink um, mm -hmm. at this point. And so the materiality mm -hmm. of the brush stroke is becoming important. And then we move to two works that are going to be in the uh, in your in the show here that are also in our collection um, by Edouard Vuillard, who was um, uh, viewed as a kind of post-impressionist artist. Mm -hmm. Was part of the smaller group called the Nabi, which. Um, in Hebrew is prophet. So these are a group of artists with Bonar and Serousier who were really trying to create a kind of specific theory about artistic production and a kind of mystical approach to painting. Mm -hmm. And for for Rich, he and you can expand more. He really loves Vuillard for his intimate look at his family and his friends mm -hmm. and the studio. Uh, and again, a brushstroke that is um, kind of presenting itself as its own, even though it's still, to a certain degree, describing a body, right. describing um, describing the, um, I don't know what she's sewing there. I don't know, she's sewing some fabric there. Yeah, there. yeah, um, she's a dressmaker. But I think this this intimate look is something that Rich is really inspired by. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, and this is um, a very unconventional, even a provocative gesture for a, a a young painter for his first museum exhibition to display alongside his works four master works from the permanent collection of an encyclopedic institution like the St. Louis Art Museum, and particularly these extraordinary works, these two Vuillards, uh, Pierre Bonnard's Still Life, Which and then, the next one. oh yes, um, this is the other Vuillard, a Pierre Bonnard's Still Life, and this uh, William Orpen self-portrait. Um, which is really the anomaly um, among the four. But um, it's, it's a provocative gesture, not only because he's integrating these paintings into his own exhibition, um, and not as a separate show, um, although, you know, you, he, he is, um, there isn't a, um, he is taking the approach of creating a kind of, a, a specific grouping among them. Um, but, you know, it's um, also he sees it, he recognizes, and this we've talked about, he recognizes that it is not fashion, that it's not fashionable for him as a contemporary painter working in New York to be thinking about the paintings at the turn of the last century um, instead of paintings more recent history, the works of Luke Toymans or Peter Doig or even post-war abstraction that we were just thinking about. Um, and what draws him so much to these kinds of works um, is that attention to, um, to brushwork that, as Tricia said, can um, stand on its own um, as, um, as, a, and as, a, as an expressive gesture, but also represents um, something in life. Right. Um, I mean, the brushstroke is not necessarily just the material gesture. Right. Right. Um, for example, with the Impressionists, what a lot of art historians and critics talk about is with that Impressionist, can we go down? With that uh, Impressionist yeah. brushstroke, um, no, to the, to oh, the Monet. To, yeah. Um, yeah. With the Impressionist brushstroke, it's not only about the materiality, but it's also to kind of, that these artists were feeling at the time this anxiety of this new modern society right. and mm -hmm. what the railroad brought to society. You were, now you're actually moving fast. I mean, they yeah. would, the 19th century French people would be shocked about our mm -hmm. texting and all that, but that, that there was this incredible level of uncertainty and anxiety at this moment at that, and the elimination of this window onto the world that's based on perspectival ordering. Right. So that Impressionism and into the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century, perspective is completely gone. Mm -hmm. And we all know we learn perspective. It's the vanishing point. You know, you're on King's Highway and you're looking, you're looking down south and you see Barnes Jewish and you see everything converging into the at one yeah. point. Well, the Impressionists, they say, bye-bye, no more of that. So there's no way to logically order the painting anymore. And that anxiety uh, reemerges through the brush stroke as we go through yeah. with, um, with Vuillard and then, of course, to Cezanne, which mm -hmm. this is, of course, not in our collection. This <laughs> is in the Mets. Um, 
And uh, here, this is 1899, yeah. or 18, around 1899, where Cezanne gets rid of perspective altogether mm -hmm. and a single viewpoint. And so right. you look at the different pots from different viewpoints. Mm -hmm. um, the, the tabletop kind of moves along and curves up. There's no logical organization. Right. And um, to complete our art history lesson, we go to um, this great example by Picasso Majoli from MoMA's collection. Um, and here you have a complete dis disintegration of the bodily form mm -hmm. into just these, you know, abstract planes that are inspired by Cezanne. And, and that leads us into abstraction that allows us to um, go to, um, to the Russian constructivist, to Mondrian's right. beautiful primary canvases, mm -hmm. um, and then of course taking us to Jackson Pollock and Klein and, and then to Gustin. Right. And so I think what Rich is doing a lot of his works mm -hmm. is reintroducing the personal, although it's masked in many ways yeah. as, as you were talking about, mm -hmm. but again, bringing this uncertainty and anxiety now about what it is to live in the 21st right. century. And I think that it's a personal anxiety as well as mm -hmm. a more universal anxiety, and that he is asking a lot of the viewer mm -hmm. in, his, in his paintings. And I think that is what makes great art, is our paintings that challenge you and aren't just offering easy answers to you. Um, and I think that's what's really exciting about Rich's work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, uh, I wanted to come back to um, one last painting to show you of Rich's, but I, let me come back to the Voyard for just a moment, um, because this is really the work that um, set Rich off in thinking about including these four works from SLAM in the show. Um, and what what has pushed him and his interest in this period past a, a century of of painting um, that has continued to break open um, is that these artists are um, well well perspective disappears um, these are and and the brushwork becomes looser more explicit um, these paintings still are deeply invested in a meaningful representation of life. Um, and as um, pushing away from the, uh, the larger impulses of post-war abstraction, um, which are very much about surface and materiality and what's happening on the canvas, um, uh, these, um, for Rich, um, he's drawn to the ways in which um, we can communicate and what are, and oh. what are those? Oh yeah, that? yeah. These are. Um, this is looking with mirror apparatus, and this is actually um, the form. Those two. Uh, those two squares at the top of the painting um, <coughs> reference an older painting just called Looking, um, and and these are the kinds of quotations you'll find from one painting to the next. Um, and you find it, these are two pages from um, that are the Italian translation and the English um, lyrics for Sid Barrett's song "Words." Um, and within it, he's inserted. Rich has inserted these little mirrors. So it becomes a, a portrait of the viewer, a portrait, a self-portrait. Um, and Sid Barrett. This is. I, I'm not oh, a big movie. I'm not a big. Mu I don't know much about music, but he apparently didn't he play like he was in the. Pink Floyd's first band or something like that, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, just putting context, yeah. that's what it's about. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, and it's also, I mean, this is also a painting that um, shows uh, Rich's fondness for visual play and humor. You'll see that in a lot of the work. I mean, these are um, serious explorations about painting, but um, he's, He's keen to um, to make sure that humor is present throughout the work, um, and whether they're wry looks from one painting to the next, or you have a pa you have a painting that turns into a smiley face, um, uh, it, it's an important element of for him of your experience of these paintings. 
Um, and finally, and this has been a key work for um, that we've been using uh, in our materials about the show. But you know, at, at some uh, points in his work, um, not only will the um, you know, in, in the case of the Nina Simone painting, um, you have uh, vinyl text on the canvas and that's it. It's, a, it's an incredibly um, stripped down um, composition that's void of the artist's hand, but a piece like this where he's actually um, removed the canvas ex itself to uh, reveal the support behind it. And what you can't see, but I urge you to come back and look for in this show, is that there are two, um, there, you see, there are two uh, slivers that run from almost the top of the painting down on each side of, of the ca um, canvas. And you won't, again, you won't see this until you are there in person, but um, each of those slivers is painted on the sides. Um, and it really becomes, this is a painting that um, really becomes sculptural as well. Um, so he's, Rich is deeply invested in exploring the ways in which, again, we see painting and can think about painting, but... And even the backs of paintings. And the backs of, the backs of paintings. Um, but what I anticipate will happen when these works are presented alongside the works from the St. Louis Art Museum um, is that you'll be pushed even further into thinking about what these, um, what style means, um, how history is represented, particularly in a context like this, which is entirely unconventional and one you wouldn't experience in, um, in a traditional museum display. Um, and to think about what, um, how, and in how many different ways we can communicate our experience through on, on a canvas. Yeah. yeah. Any questions or, or comments? Again, frustrations. <laughs> we can, I'm happy that we can certainly go back and look at other images too, if you if you'd like to see others in detail. Um, now these are all, you'll see in the show that these are all uniformly scaled, all, all 20 of the paintings. Um, this is another kind of, um, this is another kind of nuance within the work, another more kind of complication for Rich in that he, when he started out and he was experimenting with different forms and gestures, the, um, the scale of the paintings would shift. He made and he still makes some paintings that are very small, some that are very large, and as soon as he was identified at a very young age just out of art school making these paintings, um, as soon as that eclecticism was identified by dealers, writers, as a style, um, he, um, you know, he, he instantly retreated and thought about how he could, again, complicate um, what, how we understand the work, how we can categorize the work, and so he started with these experimentations using exactly the same frame, uses the same um, frame maker, um, and they're all exactly the same size. Um, and it'll be really interesting to see in the context of this exhibition how that will push you to consider what's happening on the canvas, um, because um, physically and in terms, you know, um, in your relationship of you know your body to the scale of this painting, you're going to be having the same experience from one painting to the next, although something entirely different is happening from one to the next. And to just uh, one question: Did Rich um, work with you on the order of the installation so that he, or is this something that you're just? We're going to do it next week. week. Okay, um, <laughs> it hasn't all been chosen. No, okay. um, I think uh, you know he um, he's interested and he's. Um, We've been talking about um, how uh, when we produce the catalog for the show, um, we, or Rich wants to or order them chronologically. Um, so you can see this progression, see a narrative develop. Um, and he, um, I don't think that that will happen in the show, but it's possible, um, <coughs> which will, um, I think reveal a story that really hasn't been present before. As you're, you know, if, if you if you have seen Rich's work here and there, um, you know, even even if you haven't, but you're seeing them 
sort of grouped differently that tells a very different story as opposed to a, a kind of reading of them. So we'll see next week, I think, what, how he wants to um, how he wants to present them. Can I share with you one quotation to close the evening? Um, just thinking about this again, this idea of the the unfinished and the brushstroke. Um, in reading this one essay that's about this idea of the unfinished, mm -hmm. there was a really interesting quotation um, by the French poet Paul Valéry that I thought would be, that's very apropos to Rich's work, um, which is, this is what he wrote, quote, to complete a work consists in getting rid of everything that reveals or hints at how it was made, unquote. And I think that really sums up um, what we were talking about today, but as well as Richard's work, and that he doesn't want to give everything away. Right. Um, he wants, part of it I think he wants to keep for himself. There's mm -hmm. a bit of this kind of personal selfishness that, that he has, mm -hmm. this intimate this intimate relationship he has with his painting and, and his friends and his inspiration. But I think he also really wants you, not necessarily to complete it mm -hmm. completely, but right. for you to think beyond what he's giving you, if that, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. And that you might not ever achieve that completion in, in your mind. And I think that's also what's compelling, is that some artists will give you the clues, and then as a, as a viewer, you can complete it and understand it. Mm -hmm. But he, he gives you some, and he doesn't let you right. get and it all. Right, and then changes the rules. Then he changes the rules, yeah. And the next painting, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's really nice. Great. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thank thanks. you so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming.